So we live. Hello, everyone. Yes, sir. The recording is started. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, welcome to the GDAR project spotlight for today. Uh, I'm Amshiman Gwen, uh, senior research engineer at Georgia Tech. Um, I'll be your host today. And uh, so I know we are running four minutes late, so I'd, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first project is by Dr. George Yuzu. Um, Dr. George Yuzufu is professor in water and environmental engineering in the Department of Civil Engineering and Construction at George G. S. Southern University. He has been uh, working on environmental engineering with an emphasis on water and environment for more than 30 years. Um, so with that, over to you, Dr. Fu. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, for your uh, introduction uh, and uh, thank you everyone. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to uh, present our uh, GDOT project on uh, water quality uh, impacts from, uh, you know, uh, uh, scalper drains on a receiving water body. Uh, so uh, this is today's uh, outline for my presentation. Uh, introduction, uh, problem st uh, statement, uh, objectives, and field work, lab work, and modeling work, uh, major results and major takeaways from this project and uh, acknowledgements. So first of all, I, I would like to uh, give you a big picture on, uh, on this, uh, you know, the project setup. And uh, from this gra uh, graph, you can see, say, you know, the bridge uh, crossing these uh, streams. And then uh, uh, you, uh, you see the, you know, the rivers is underneath. Then uh, uh, once the, you know, the rainfall event taking place, you see the uh, precipitation. Uh, we will hit the, the deck surface and then uh, form this uh, deck runoff. Then uh, uh, you can pay attention on these uh, scalpers, uh, these uh, black dots. And then, uh, you know, the back runoff will be discharged, uh, you know, directly through these uh, scalpers. And uh, basically, uh, these scalpers are, you know, the vertical, like a short section of uh, four inch pipe. And uh, they, uh, you know, distribute it, uh, say, uh, like 10 feet apart. Then uh, you can imagine, you know, uh, there may be a lot of these uh, pollutants uh, in this, uh, you know, deck runoff. For example, these uh, heavy metals and uh, these solids and oil, uh, grease, and the nutrients, and uh, you can uh, imagine. And then uh, you see this uh, pH, uh, poly, uh, aromic, uh, poly uh, uh, aromic uh, hydrocarbons. And these are the, you know, the, say, uh, the, like the product related to this combustion product. Then you can see, uh, uh, you know, the river flow and the upstream and downstream. For us, you know, uh, we try to, uh, you know, collect these, uh, you know, the scalper drain sample directly and then uh, pass these uh, pollutants. Then uh, at the same time, you know, we take this uh, uh, in stream sample from upstream and downstream. Then uh, we has the same in parallel, and then we can have this uh, direct comparison uh, related to these uh, pollutants. So here is the problem statement, and uh, say everyone knows, you know, bridge have uh, traditionally designed to discharge their sound water runoff through these uh, scalper drains directly uh, to the uh, streams and the river underneath. Uh, without any treatment. So uh, please pay attention on that part. Then, uh, you know, uh, there will be concern regarding this, uh, you know, the bridge, some water runoff through these uh, scalper drains, and uh, they may say have a negatively uh, impact on the water quality underneath. 
And we have uh, two general objectives. First one, and uh, we need to uh, investigate uh, water quality impact of uh, bridge stormwater runoff through this uh, scalmer drain on uh, receiving waters uh, by conducting this uh, field work and lab work. And then, uh, you know, uh, we have another part of the objective is to uh, develop an efficient uh, simulation tools by applying these uh, uh, stochastic uh, empirical loading and dilution model. So uh, the acronym is SELDOM. And uh, so these are the two parts. This map uh, show the, you know, the location and basically uh, the, you see uh, this is a Georgia map, a uh, two start uh, southeast region close to Georgia southern and then uh, you know the north Georgia and uh, you know you see this uh, map and uh, say in southeast we have uh, four uh, bridge sites. Uh, you know this uh, uh, Rocky Ford uh, SR24 and uh, US80 and actually uh, these three bridges, they all cross the same river, uh, Odichi River. And then uh, this SR297 crossing another river is called the uh, Ohupi uh, River. Then, uh, you know, uh, you can see this is our, you know, Georgia Southern location. And uh, basically, uh, this is the closest to us uh, for the sampling purpose. And uh, we start uh, this SR24 as our first site. And that's, you see uh, this closest one. And, uh, you know, so generally speaking, we try to set up this protocol and from this first bridge, and then we kind of, uh, you know, uh, implement the same protocol to other locations. Then, you know, uh, for the North Georgia, we include the two sites and uh, uh, US uh, 255, uh, that one uh, uh, across that river of, uh, you know, the Chattanooga River, and then uh, the other one uh, crossing the river, like SR197, uh, crossing that, uh, you know, the, uh, say, Sauk River. So these are the uh, six sites. Then, uh, you know, uh, this is our first uh, test site, uh, you know, the SR24. And uh, you see uh, from this, uh, include the four photos, like three photos, like left side, uh, show the, uh, you know, the bridge uh, crossing this, uh, you know, the Ojichi River. And then uh, this second in the middle shows the, you know, the uh, bridge sur uh, surface. And then uh, uh, right side photo, you will see the, you know, scalper there. Uh, you know, on the deck. Excuse me, and uh, try to. Then, uh, you know, uh, for this uh, site works, uh, there's one important starting point, and these are the on site apparatus set up for scalper drain uh, sampling. And uh, you see, this is the photos and uh, say, this is the bridge. And you see, uh, uh, we have this, uh, you know, the funnel uh, connected to the scalper directly. And then uh, get this uh, scalper, drain, uh, scalper drain directly and uh, going down. And then uh, these, we, we combine two uh, together into this vertical type, uh, pipe. Then, uh, you know, uh, I, down below, you will see this uh, horizontal section of pipe with the holes. Actually, uh, this one used for the storage of the water sample. And then, uh, you know, we use this uh, auto sampler uh, to get, uh, uh, you know, direct uh, scalper green sample directly. And, uh, you know, uh, whenever the rainfall event uh, starts. Okay. So this is the auto sampler here. And uh, you will see this kind of setup with the hose and uh, insert into this uh, horizontal section to get the scalper green sample directly. Then uh, the other one, uh, we will take this, uh, you know, the in-stream sample by using this uh, pole uh, sampling tools. And this one, you can see uh, this can be uh, extended as uh, long as uh, 25 feet. And then, uh, you know, this is the, you know, the end uh, attached with the, you know, the bottles. 
And actually, you know, uh, our uh, researcher can stand in uh, on the deck and then uh, use this uh, pole and get this uh, stream sample directly from the uh, from the river underneath of the underneath of the you know the bridge. And then uh, the other big part is related to the lab park. And uh, here are the list of the water quality we tested. Say uh, we test the three heavy metals, uh, lead, zinc, and copper. And actually, these are the uh, three common uh, highway stone water runoff, like heavy metal related. Then, uh, you know, we test these 18 uh, uh, PAHs. And uh, uh, these uh, chemical oxygen demand show the uh, pollutant, organic pollutant level. Then we test these nutrients, mainly related to the nitrogen and uh, phosphorus. Then uh, these uh, solid and uh, oil grease, DO and conductivity. And today I would like to uh, give you uh, like, uh, uh, like several uh, as a uh, uh, glimpse. Say uh, this is the, you know, the heavy metal, uh, you know, instrument test, uh, this atomic absorption spectrophotometers uh, used for the uh, heavy metal test uh, in our lab. Then uh, uh, we uh, use this uh, Shimazu GCMS uh, to test this uh, PAH, uh, 18 of them. And uh, for the, you know, the modeling work part, uh, we apply this uh, Seldon model and uh, you can see this is their, uh, you know, schematic diagram. And uh, say, uh, you see uh, this is the river and uh, we have the highway uh, and uh, with the bridge crossing. And then uh, you see these, uh, you know, the arrows shows this uh, upstream load and downstream load. And then uh, you will see this uh, highway runoff load. And then you see this red uh, spot uh, shows this copper drain and they, uh, you know, also discharge these uh, decks on water uh, directly to the river. Okay. So basically this as uh, seldom model, they use this, uh, uh, say, simple mass loading. And once we talk about mass loading, we talk about the like uh, flow rate and then we talk about this concentration. It's important for us to consider this uh, water quality impact. And uh, you know, for this research, we try to uh, uh, you know figure out from the water quality perspective mainly, like we test this uh, scorpion drain, you know, the uh, pollutants, and at the same time we consider these uh, like flow uh, directly from the deck, uh, and uh, consider the flow from the river. Okay. And uh, here I would like to show this major result, and uh, you know. Uh, Consider this uh, like 29 months project and uh, there's no way for me uh, to show everything. And I try to focus on this uh, major result. And you can see, uh, 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 generally speaking for the setup, uh, we uh, show this concentration of uh, each uh, selected water quality perimeter by doing this way, uh, do the com comparison directly from upstream uh, water and uh, this core part, scorpion drain, uh, and then a downstream uh, bridge. So you can see from this, uh, uh, there, uh, from this uh, like diagram, and actually uh, these A, B, C, D show the full uh, sources uh, bridge side. And that A is the first one shows the, uh, you know, the SR24. And you see this bar graph and shows the lead concentration. And uh, you see, uh, uh, we also uh, have this uh, like a total lead versus this uh, uh, dissolvable uh, lead. This is related to the upstream. Then uh, uh, this is the core part, uh, scorpion drain, uh, like a lead level. And then uh, this is downstream uh, level. Say uh, from this one, you can see uh, this is kind of input from the deck, uh, scorpion drain, and then uh, Sorry, this is the scorpion drain related uh, quality part, like lead related. And then uh, this is the downstream one, and this is uh, you know the upstream. Then uh, you will see, like from the color, you will see this kind of getting darker, and which means uh, you know there is like impact uh, from the discharge from scorpion drain. And then uh, you know I would like to uh, you know point out this uh, uh, 
regarding the uh, scale for the uh, concentration, like you see this bridge have the uh, high concentration, like uh, highest like one uh, ppb parts per billion level. And then, uh, you know, for the second side bridge, you can see the concentration is quite uh, low compared with the first one. Then uh, you will see upstream and then a scalper drain and then a downstream. So with this kind of setup, you will see the directly comparison. And uh, uh, we will talk about this uh, later on. Then uh, uh, this shows the, you know, the, like the time uh, intervals. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we talk about this, uh, like uh, uh, first uh, flush uh, related to the beginning of the rainfall event. And normally at uh, that period, you will run into this uh, higher uh, concentration in general. And then uh, with time increase, uh, you will expect this uh, uh, you know, concentration will be reduced. And these are the general trend to show this uh, uh, full uh, bridge site. These A and B shows the same bridge site at different time. Then, uh, you know, these are the, you know, the sum precipitation uh, got it from the USGS uh, uh, website and to show the precipitation. Uh, basically, we try to uh, build up the link between the, uh, you know, the water quality versus this, uh, you know, the rainfall event. And actually, uh, we, you can imagine this kind of a longer dry period. And then uh, once you have this uh, rainfall event, you will expect this uh, higher, uh, you know, the, uh, runoff uh, concentration in general. And here is the uh, you know, summary related to this heavy metal result. And uh, say in general, the introduction of these uh, three heavy metals, lead, zinc, and copper from copper drain into the in-stream water, uh, actually they, we can observe this uh, uh, impact in most cases. And uh, that one lead, uh, led to this uh, you know the elevated downstream heavy metal concentration and uh, regarding this uh, pH and you can see this kind of uh, uh, result say this is upstream and this is scalper related scalper drain related and this is downstream say uh, in general uh, you will see uh, actually is undetectable from the upstream and uh, these are the undetectable and here, you know, we ran into these uh, two caves and you can uh, find out and just give you guys a general idea, uh, pay attention on this uh, concentration. And we talk about this uh, uh, parts per trillion level. And, uh, you know, uh, actually it's a uh, uh, trace, uh, you know, concentration is very low, okay? So uh, that one, you can see uh, these uh, two types of these, uh, you know, the pH. And uh, we talk about this uh, 15, 17 parts per trillion is uh, a pretty, uh, pretty low concentration. And then uh, here is the general summary. And uh, among these 18 pH investigate, uh, we only uh, you know, uh, able to test these uh, seven uh, in this uh, uh, parts per trillion level in these copper greens. And these are related to the site in the Southeast region, SR24 and US80. Then uh, the third part related to this uh, uh, seldom model, uh, you will see uh, this uh, is the application for the seldom model for the first uh, bridge site and uh, related to the pH. And then uh, uh, you see uh, this is the uh, related to the uh, storm uh, like numbers. Say uh, we've seen that uh, 30 years and uh, for that model, uh, they run this, uh, you know, the like, uh, like over 1600 uh, rainfall event with a different rainfall uh, intensity and duration. And then this is pH level. And then uh, uh, this is uh, related to the uh, 30 year, uh, uh, you know, the prediction. And this is the range for the pH. And, uh, you know, we also apply this uh, seldom uh, for this uh, total like six bridge site. And uh, the model can uh, give us this uh, like uh, minimum average and, uh, you know, the maximum level. And among these six bridge, and you can see actually, you know, uh, regarding these uh, uh, 
you know, the seldom uh, result. Generally speaking, they uh, like uh, comparable to our like a uh, lab result. But there are two, uh, like uh, north side one. In general, you know, this is for the uh, phosphorus. And uh, from our lab result, it's uh, quite like low level. But uh, for some reason, you know, these uh, cell cell the model predict with a higher uh, concentration. This is kind of, uh, you know, the outlier and, uh, you know, it may indicate some kind of other uh, fighting factors. And uh, uh, at the end of this uh, presentation, I would like to uh, give you like the major takeaways uh, from this project. Uh, first one uh, is the short-term impact of scopper drain on downstream water quality was uh, observable uh, for all these uh, water quality perimeter plastics. On the other hand, you should pay attention to this uh, potential water quality impact from a bridge deck scalper drain uh, contamination is uh, considered minor uh, with respect to the mass loading. Say uh, you can see, uh, even though you, know, you may observe this scalper drain with a higher concentration, however, Consider this uh, like a flow uh, from the deck, uh, bridge deck. It's uh, the mass loading is kind of minor. Uh, so uh, you can think about this from engineering perspective regarding the loading side. Okay. And at the end, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, to uh, these guys like uh, David Harleen, uh, Don Dickman, and Brent. Uh, Brandon uh, from Jordi DOT and uh, three uh, Jordi Southern senior product team and Jordi Southern facility department. And uh, you know, the uh, Sean Jackson, uh, our lab uh, coordinator. And uh, lastly, but not least is uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Greg uh, Gran uh, Granito, uh, USG. Uh, he is the, actually the founder or developer of the Seldom and uh, Hydrolysis. And Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fu. Um, we are running a couple minutes late, so I'll uh, hold off on any questions and we'll take them at the end, if that's okay with you. Yep, sure. Okay. All right. So uh, I will stop uh, sharing. Yes, please. Okay. Thanks again. Um, so our next presenter is Dr. John Calabria, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Georgia. Uh, Dr. Calabria is a licensed landscape architect, and uh, his research includes landscape performance and the amelioration of land use impacts on freshwater and coastal system. With that, over to you, Dr. Calabria. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here and wanted to report on a multi-phase interdisciplinary study that we did at the coast involving Birdlong Island. It's the second seaward island in the Savannah River and is fully located in Georgia. DOT's interest in the site is for mitigation. It has a lot of salt marsh mitigation and it's a dredge island. And we were tasked with figuring out opportunities to enhance a cultural site so it wouldn't wash away and then figure out opportunities to enhance the marsh and uh, some other things using nature based solutions. So here you can see the various uh, projects. The one I'll be primarily reporting on today is 1905 that uh, Brennan Roney had helped us um, work through and that's the management study for bird long phase two. And we looked at enhancement and restoration interventions. Uh, for shoreline alternatives, and then did some design and modeling for stewardship. And it involved a variety of entities for this interdisciplinary project. The first phase led by Dr. Alexander included Dr. Haas and myself, and we looked at some of the long-term shoreline movement and deployed some oyster spat sticks to determine if there's oyster recruitment in the area. And then we looked at some of the vegetation and channel velocities. Then that was divided into two subphases. And then the one I'll report on today is for phase two, where we looked at what are the solutions based on all the 
inventory information that we learned in the previous phase. And then we came up with several conceptual plans with some strategies using nat nature-based solutions and other solutions on Bird Long Island. And I'd like to acknowledge um, that one was led by myself with Dr. Alexander and Dr. Haas as copias for their modeling work. And then their PhD student, my PhD student, and uh, several other folks that were at Marine Extension as well. So to acquaint you with Bird Long Island, uh, this is Tybee Island, which many of you are probably familiar with. The state line bisects the channel of the Savannah River, and in our site is outlined here, and that's Bird Long. It's situated between Cockspur Island that has Fort Pulaski on it, and Elba, which has uh, some of the Corps of Engineers facilities on that. So that's the orientation of where the site is. And then this is the actual site of Bird Long Island. Some of the marsh condition is in poor shape, and there are several breaches that we're concerned about. There were three extant islands. One of them had a Civil War fortification on, and all of the islands have been joined by dredge activities uh, for quite some time in the uh, Savannah River. This is a channel marker that you can see um, in the Savannah River for a, a guiding post as you navigate in. So it's situated adjacent to uh, major dredging activities. And here we've changed north a little bit on you just so we could fit in Bird Long Island. But here's the island, and then we have a number of strategies that I'll go through. But first, want to direct your attention to a breach that has formed. Um, not even 10 years ago, the island was connected to Cockspur Island, and Bird Long has breached there. And then during the course of the study, we had several um, storms and in ship wake, and we are having another breach form in here. So the island is literally washing away, and we proposed interventions to try to stabilize the island and keep it from washing away, and then try to enhance the marsh, preserve some of the cultural resources, and then figure out what we could do with some of the upland area, which has uh, some native indigenous vegetation on it, but a lot of aggressive exotic vegetation on that as well. So here's an example of one of the breach sites. There's um, a lot of marsh that has been lost. You can see the blowout in between some of the existing marsh platform that's left. And then I can direct your attention to this area. That's where on uh, several um, higher high tides, you actually get a connection between the north and south channel to form the second breach area that I highlighted. So that breach is pretty imminent and of concern as well, because we don't want to lose the uh, the island in that area. So that's more or less where the, the breach site is on the, uh, the second one that I shared with you. So we proposed through axonometrics, which illustrate in um, plan view some of the things you can see from the bird's eye perspective, and it also has a cross section so that you could understand things from the cross section perspective. There is a extant Civil um, War earthworks, and not much is visible today except for some raised areas of marsh. But this was in many ways what instigated the project in addition to preserving some of the shoreline and the uh, marsh platform so that could be used for mitigation credit. So on the site, you can see some fortifications. There's a munitions site here. There's some submerged cannon platforms. There's also some evidence of part of the structure. And then um, what is already washed away that was not known until we did our study. And my excellent grad student, who's very good with uh, GIS, Emily Dolotowski, was able to overlay some historic maps. And we found the first tier or the um, first bit of the fort has already washed away. So we have a jeopardized cultural resource that would um, want to save. So on the, um, we did four scenarios, uh, the first of which is do nothing. So in one of our reports, we estimated that the second berm based on historic erosion rates uh, would be tens of years before that is threatened and taken away. 
and then um, we estimate that um, over 100 years, the entire um, area will either be inundated or lost to um, shoreline erosion. So here's a perspective from the boat. The site's not accessible by vehicle other than boat or swimming if you're a robust swimmer. And here's some of the uh, tall marsh grass that's on the edge just to give you some site context. And then you can see some of the vegetation from some of the elevated uh, sections that have the cultural resources on those that we want to protect. So in one of the options was just to, and this is not the nature-based solution, although it can be made to have some nature-based solution qualities, was to try to protect it just with a uh, bulkhead. Some of the uh, pros are that are that um, it could be placed, then some of the cons are that it's only gonna be as strong as the day it was built. And then any overland flow that would come from behind the island, which is highly likely, would uh, jeopardize the bulkhead from the back. But that's certainly one option that could be um, placed for a proposed option to try to preserve the cultural resource. Uh, another option is the proposed living shoreline. And this is a nature-based solution where we can put in oyster bagged shell because there's not a lot of substrate for oysters currently to latch onto. And we had Dr. Haas produce multiple uh, scenarios to give us an idea of what shear stress would be present from the South Channel um, via estimates from the North Channel with the ship wake. Keep in mind, we're gonna have additional ship wake from the larger craft that'll be coming through the um, fairly newly dredged channel. So in here, you can see the living shoreline and um, we tested a adjacent site on Tybee Island where Marine Extension several years ago built a living shoreline and that's where Dr. Haas was able to go in with his um, doctoral student and do some velocity testing at various tides to determine shear stresses and make sure that the living shoreline um, could withstand some of the shear stresses that are in the South Channel and he confirmed that uh, that was certainly a possibility. Then we also, with the help of Marine Extension uh, folks, uh, Tom Bliss and some others, were able to put in spat sticks because we wanted to test recruitment. So we could build it, but we didn't know if they would come. So we placed the um, spat sticks, which are ways that we can see what the natural recruitments in the recruitment of oyster spat were. Spat's a part of the life cycle of the oyster that attaches, it's the um, basically a little baby for non-biologists, and it has to put its feet down somewhere to attach. So we tested to see how much was naturally available at three different places along the island and found uh, through numerous seasons that the uh, opportunity for spat to attach is uh, certainly viable for what we're proposing. And in plan view, we generated several different concepts of what we could do because of all the dredging activity and some of the impoundments, we have um, ready available dredge material. The Savannah District Corps of Engineers is interested in disposal sites, as they call it, and is very interested in beneficial dredge placement. So we ran a suitability analysis to determine the um, highest priority and then next priority for placement of thin layer placement of dredge material which would not exceed 10 centimeters in depth. And then we ran some quantities to determine what could be used for maintenance dredge activities, which happen uh, every several years. And then also for larger dredge activities, there's uh, particulate analysis and some other things done. So we try to match up what some of the dredge was with what would be placed on the marsh. We were able to benefit from one of the studies um, south of here that suggested that if you had an impaired marsh that the opportunities for placing beneficial dredge um, could benefit it. We also have areas that have a little better quality marsh and we may not want to place um, thin layer placement in those areas. So a number of the scenarios that we explored were on Bird Long Island, which is right here. There's multiple uh, dredge placement areas that are accessible as well as the existing dredge that um, happens in the channel for maintenance activities and we're within the 10,000 feet uh, plumbing requirement for uh, using that dredge if we wanted to. 
So there's some of the um, containment areas that are adjacent to our site and have dredge we'd like to use. So as I wrap up in the next three and a half minutes, I'll share with you several of the plans that we developed in this highlighted area of yellow. You can see that these are our highest um, priority placement areas for thin layer placement of dredge. And then that would help protect some of the cultural resources. Dr. Alexander um, estimates we have about uh, one meter of increase in sea level rise with enough sediment to naturally uh, deposit in these areas, but we can certainly accelerate that or after we rise uh, by one meter, we can certainly have the beneficial dredge opportunity to elevate the marsh platform. Some other things we proposed were to come in and try to alleviate some of the most severe erosion from ship traffic on the north channel, which is uh, through here, and that's the dredge channel. This here, of course, is the south channel that's not dredged and fairly shallow. So we looked at a number of opportunities um, using um, harder structures. The living shoreline would certainly not be feasible in this area, but there's opportunities to continue either Johnson Rocks, which is very expensive and has low habitat, or to consider any other kind of bulkheading where we could alter the face of the bulkhead and provide some um, opportunity for um, enhancing some of the habitat in that area. Another option, we looked at actually reconnecting some of the islands and fixing, fixing the second breach that's forming in this area, and then actually looking at uh, changing over the upland section, which is anything above two meters above the um, sea level that we were using, and actually turn that into a man fire managed landscape. So we could do things like longleaf pine or a savanna esque or grassland landscape, and then that would help reduce some of the aggressive exotic um, plants that are colonizing pretty heavily now. Um, some other options we looked at were um, if you really wanted to go crazy, then doing some more bulkheading for a longer area to try to reunite these two islands and then protect them. And then all of these are in combination with the addition of thin layer placement. The priority area is in the dark yellow, and then the second, that's the highest priority in dark yellow, and then the second priority are these areas in the golden color. So we could place um, between 50,000 yards and over 150,000 yards, depending uh, what we would use, and that material is uh, very available for us to place. And it's always fun to take some students down. We had a couple of vegetative cross sections that I cut with some students from uh, ecological restoration class and ecology class. So appreciate DOT letting us on the island to do some student work as well. So it was a very fast coverage of Bird Long Island, but essentially we're trying to keep DOT's mitigation bank from or mitigation site from washing away. There's a number of cuts and breaches and then a lot of aggressive exotic vegetation, particularly on the upland areas and then a cultural resource that we wanted to minimize um, any further impacts to those. So my, that's I'm at time now. I'm happy to take questions towards the end or whenever the Moderator thinks that's the most feasible, but appreciate y'all paying attention and glad to answer any questions. Hi, um, thanks Dr. Calabria. Yes, we'll hold off the questions uh, to land. Uh, please, uh, everybody else, please go ahead and, and keep your questions coming on the chat. We will um, we will address them at the end if we can save a few minutes. Um, so our last presenter today is Dr. Ashuri. Dr. Baba Ashuri is a professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, his work has focused on quantitative methods for construction engineering and management with in important contributions in the areas of construction analytics, innovative project delivery, and valuation of green energy investments. With that, Baba. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gwen. Thank you, the, uh, Dr. Angoshman. So uh, can you hear me well? Can you see yeah. the slide? OK, good, good. All right. Uh, first of all, I'm thank thankful for this opportunity. Thanks for uh, Georgia DOT for acknowledging and appreciating the, the good work that all of the 
member institution at Georgia Transportation Institute does. This particular project, we uh, I was the PI on that, and we have uh, Ms. Ming Shu Li. Uh, she was uh, she is the graduate research assistant at Georgia Tech and PhD students in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. And Dr. Beck from Kennesaw State University was the co-PI on the project with me. So uh, what we did, we basically uh, work with uh, technical project champions of this uh, research, Mr. Rodi and Mr. Woods from um, Office of uh, Roadway Design, Mr. Mr. Woods uh, assistant office head in that office. And then uh, Mr. Eric Rodi is from the Office of Engineering Services. So he's a state project review engineer. I would like to acknowledge all the great helps that we received from the Office of Performance Based Management and Research. I know all these three members moved to the new uh, offices or uh, moved out of the GDOT, Ms. Kamatkar, Ms. Lamut, and uh, Mr. Tapa. And uh, definitely you will see the great helps that we received from the Office of uh, IT because uh, there is a software that we develop and is currently used by the GDOT. Uh, and uh, Mr. Tick Buchanan, uh, Buchanan, you know, has been very fun, uh, central in the success of deploying and implementing the research. Uh, so uh, just telling you a little bit about the topic, uh, the topic was around the needs that GDOT has in terms of enhancing the accuracy of the estimation process. And particularly, they had trouble with the lump sum pay items, and in particular, traffic control items and grading complete. And we believe we would be able to enhance that through the use of advanced machine learning techniques and advanced estimation technique. So the, the topic of the research, the objective, the clear objectives that we have here, we want to increase the accuracy of early cost estimation. So these are early stage when you are putting together the concept report or you have just early stage information about the project. So that's where most of the design team leaders had trouble to identify the scope of the job, the parameters are not there, and these are lump sum items. So you really do not have a good estimate of the quantity and a lot of the fundamental information is missing. But we believe there is enough information embedded in the text documents on the concept report or some of the PFPR or FFPR reports that can help design leaders to identify parameters around uh, estimating the lump sum items, traffic controls and grading complete in particular. So we first develop certain kind of uh, algorithms related to the natural language processing, NLP and text mining. We harvest good amount of information from those on a structured data and then apply various models of you know, machine learning algorithms to enhance the accuracy because the problem is multidimensional and the problem is uh, pretty difficult for the traditional type of a statistical analysis to give us good answers. So I provide you a little bit uh, information about the data. So as you can see, we have on the left side of your screen, 304 highway projects with the lump sum pay items related to the traffic control and the grading complete on the right side of your uh, uh, screen. You can see the distribution of that. So what you can see a lot of data points on this smaller side, but you have a long tail. And this long tails is the ones that we were concerned about that because if G dot missing those would be big trouble because you would under budget the job and that's that's usually the beginning of a lot of issues uh, surrounding the the inefficiency in the project delivery, whether the speed or the cost of the the project. So we want to deal with the data that is not homogeneously uh, across the different range. Certainly, there might be some needs for partitioning that we're going to talk about that in a second. The, the information we were able to harvest, so here are some lists. I'm not going through all of that, so you would have a copy of the presentation and the report is available, but a lot of information that is already labeled in the concept report or the final field plan review, but there are a bunch of information that was very unstructured. So these are the things that we harvest from concept report, you know, FFPR, PFPR, and of course the pre-construction status report. Uh, we get information out of that. So uh, 
uh, moving forward, these are the challenges we noticed. When we had the data in the pre-screening and pre-processing the data, we noticed there are a lot of unstructured text, so therefore we use uh, text mining algorithms. Uh, high dimensionality, so we, we have, let's say, 300 to 350 data points at most, but we have so many dimensions. So usually these are the cases the accuracy would not be great unless you do some dimensionality reduction like through the PCA algorithms or uh, Brutal type of you know, feature selection that we have to apply. And I already show you that the data is skewness, so we would have over and under sampling issues that we want to avoid that, you know, dealing with the tail. And of course, you know, when we have long span of data, whatever model you have, you cannot say, okay, one model works for entire uh, field. You need to have some sort of, you know, partitioning of the data sets. So, uh, and we, we're going to show it to you based on the project size in terms of dollars. That would be a good accuracy. When we try multiple uh, configuration, we realize there are certain parts that we can achieve higher accuracy if we partition the data sets. So here again is an overview of those methods, how, how we handle the data issues uh, in terms of harvesting the data, dealing with the data skewness, and also the multiple feature to all, in order to reduce the dimensionality and dealing with the complexity and nonlinearity of the problems in hand. Overview of the methodology. Of course, I already discussed the pre-processing stage. When we get to the modeling, we use that 90-10% sort of you know, training and testing split uh, and several uh, machine learning algorithms from random forest to bagging to the neural network and uh, finally putting all of them together. Because as I said, the, in terms of validation, we realized nine, none of these models would provide the best accuracy for the entire range of the grading complete or traffic control lump sum items. You need to uh, sometimes divide them, divide the data set into several partitions. And that's what we did in, in this research and be able to increase the accuracy to the level that is uh, quite acceptable for GDOT. Here is summary of the results. So you can see uh, we try multiple algorithms, multiple machine learning algorithms from KN to the random forest to bagging to a stacking and OLS. Uh, linear regression, which was sort of our baseline kind of, you know, uh, traditional statistical an analysis. And under different segments, based on the project cost, you would see we have uh, one model which is more appropriate. Like, for example, if the project is under a million dollar, K and algorithms give us a very good accuracy, almost, you know, 6% based on um, uh, MAPE, mean absolute percent error. The segment two, random forest is the good one. The segment three, K and algorithms again. Segment four, somewhere between 2.8 to 10 million projects. Random forest and uh, anything above $10 million, that was a stacking regressors. The ridge regression would be a best approach for that. So uh, when you see uh, this is the accuracy, so you have the predicted one on the vertical axis and the actual one on the horizontal axis. So you can see the accuracy and these are the issues we had like you know uh, what you're going to do with the uh, tail that we have or uh, the cluster that we see here so that's why we use partitioning in order to address this data challenge the same thing these are the results for the grading complete we realize only three segments would be good, good enough and kn in two of them are the best model uh, on 1.8 million and between 1.8 and 2.8. But we were able to use KN in this segment and increase the accuracy to even a greater degree under uh, 4% to be exact, 3.56%. And segment three, Grand Mont Random Forest would give us a best solution. So that's again sort of the uh, uh, scatter plot prediction against the actual, and you can see the results are pretty good line up with this 45 degree, but not nearly as good as what we had for uh, the previous case. And again, this is talking about the nature of uh, nature and complexity of the problem. So what we did, we developed a, a web-based application 
and this is something currently deployed thanks to Mr. Buchanan. You know, TIG helps us uh, deploy the software. And I'm going to stop here and ask my uh, PhD student, Ms. Ming Shu Li, she shares her screen and walk you through how that tool can be used. Ming Shu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ashuri. So uh, let me share my screen. I think everyone can see my screen right now. Okay, cool. So now yes. let's take a, uh, take a look at, at this web-based application and showcase its practical usage through uh, real project data. So this web-based application tool was developed in a Python environment and deployed to a web server to provide price estimation of traffic control and grading complete. The tool consists of a home page, navigation page, data inputs page, and results page. As shown on the screen, this is the home page of this tool, which contains separate links to navigation pages for traffic control and grading complete. And also the user menu is available for reference. So after selecting a lump sum pay item on the home page, for example, traffic control, the user is directed to the intended navigation page. The navigation page contains links to three different input sections. The numeric attributes, multiple choice, text documents, and of course, the results page. We can click the go button on the row of the desired section to enter the corresponding project attributes. After completion of each input section, use the go back button to return to the navigation page or the continue button to go to the next input section. So let's use the real project data to demonstrate the usage of application. The example project is an operational improvement project aiming at constructing sidewalks and new bicycle facilities along North Broad Street. Let's begin with the numerical inputs. So to save time, I've already pre-filled out some fields ahead of time. So this page allows entry of numerical attributes, which include construction costs, traffic ADT, right away number of puzzles, and the project length. The user might refer to the detailed explanation for each attribute by clicking on the attribute name. The pop-up message also contains where to locate this information in the project documents. So one click for pop-up message and another click for closing the message box. For example, the traffic ADT. It says we can locate this information in the field plan review reports under the section of design data. So I've got the field, field plan review report ready here. And so under the design data, we can find the current traffic ADT is this number. So just input the number here and the number of puzzles where we can find it under the right away section is right here, 25. Just insert the number. And after filling out the blanks in the numerical inputs, let's continue to the next input section, the multiple choice page. The multiple choice page contains 13 attributes for selection from the provided options. Again, users might refer to the explanation for each field by clicking the corresponding attribute name. For example, the row type, this one is provided as a multiple option field. Users might Hold down the control key to select multiple options. For this project, it is the state route. And another thing that I like to highlight is the functional uh, classification. This, this field is designed to be a cascading drop-down list. Users first select the context, whether rural or urban, and then under each context, the corresponding classification. For this project, it is the urban minor principal arterial. I'm not go through every field to save time. So let's move forward to the next section, the text input. The text documents page contains seven different text attributes. For text inputs, the explanation is provided in the placeholder text. To insert text input, just copy the entire paragraph for each text attribute and paste it into the corresponding position. For example, the need and purpose project classification statement. We can find it in the concept report. I've also got it ready. This is the concept report for this project. And let's find the need and purpose project justification statement right here. Just copy the entire paragraph and paste it here. No further edit is needed. And the other one, the project 
description we can find in the field plan review report right here. Let's locate the project description, copy and paste. So after filling in all the information on the appropriate test document page, just hit the submit button to submit the information for the tool to process the data. Usually the computing takes a few seconds. Afterward, the tool will automatically redirect to the navigation page where the results and warnings can be accessed by selecting the go button next to the see results and warnings section. If all the required inputs are entered properly, the results page will display the message input data successful and the predicted lump sum pay item price will be displayed in the results field, which is 20,000. This is 100 accuracy for this project. Otherwise, warning information for missing or incorrectly entered items will be displayed here. So for example, let's erase this construction cost and input some random text. Continue, continue, and submit. Let's see what it says in the warning section. It tells me that the construction costs need to be re-entered in the correct format. So to start a new calculation on the result page, just click go back and return to the home page. Then select the lump sum item of interest and repeat the data input process. Similar for the grading complete, similar structure and similar inputs. To save time, I'm not going to go through the procedure again. So that's pretty much um, everything about this web application. That concludes my part on the usage of the application. And now I would like to hand over to the floor to Dr. Ashri to provide us with a summary of the presentation. Dr. Ashri. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you uh, summarized it really well. And particularly, I wanted to emphasize the area of you know textual information and collecting that information and bringing that in the to in the tool and uh, that has been i mean i think a high mark here which is you don't need to retrieve any sort of particular information you just go and grab things from the concept report and copy paste that in the into the text box and the engine behind that, the machine learning engine behind that, particularly in this case, the natural language processing and text mining algorithms, highlight the areas that are important and grab it as useful information for increasing the accuracy of the model. So there's a lot going on behind the scene, which makes the interface easier uh, for uh, users uh, as they are going into that. So to conclude that, what we showed is a, a framework for conducting that estimation, increasing the accuracy of estimation. Uh, the high marks of those uh, that that framework and the features that use one is text mining that I talked to you about the the data set in terms of data pre-processing and feature selection. We use a state of the art uh, smooth and uh, Boruta feature selection. And then we have several machine learning algorithms from KN to a stacking um, methods, uh, bagging and stacking and other machine learning, advanced machine learning techniques to try them and see which one works. And therefore, sometimes we needed to do the partitioning of the data based on the size of the project. The web-based application is now in use. Uh, GDOT hosted that on their server. And with that, you know, I guess, you know, I'd like to open up the floor. Thank you for listening to us. The, the tool is available. The, the research report is already published. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or if you have interest in using that or uh, any ideas for uh, future research or future improvement or applying this kind of machine learning. You know, in our group, we do lots of construction analytics. Uh, project management analytics. So any type of data, whether a structure or not a structure, we are interested in that. And we, we love to uh, crunch the data and find some hidden information in order to increase the accuracy of our estimation and forecasting. Uh, Dr. Gwyn, you know, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Um, so uh, I think we are, <laughs> We are three minutes beyond 1 p.m. So um, we will, uh, why don't we uh, read a, 
reader if any questions anybody has to Robert. Um, just send uh, the questions back to the email from where you received the invitation and we can uh, get the questions answered from the presenters eventually. Um, with that, thank you for joining. Um, any last words, Robert? No, sir. Again, thank you all for joining. Um, and uh, thank you for our presenters taking your time and for our MC, Dr. Gwen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Much appreciated.